So first I want to welcome everyone and thank you for coming on behalf of the library. My name is Lynn Smith and I am here because I'm a member of the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association. And we decided to join the Douglas Bicentennial celebration this year. It's 200 years since Frederick Douglass was born in 1818. So we created this traveling exhibit that you see around you, and it has a specific purpose. It talks about how Frederick Douglass is connected to the diversity in Brockton. So he's connected to women through Susan B. Anthony, to Cape Verdeans, because when he lived in New Bedford, the Cape Verdean shipbuilders were most likely the first free black men that he ever met. He's connected to Daniel O'Connell, the great emancipator in Ireland who stood next to him and fought for the Irish Catholics' right. He's connected to Toussaint Louverture. In his 80s, he served as minister to Haiti. And we know, of course, that in 2004, our Liberty Tree in Brockton got so big and so top heavy, it had to come down. And so the ladies of the local churches made this beautiful Liberty Tree faith quilt. And so Willie Wilson, who's here with us, does a lot of walking tours of downtown Brockton and talks about the Liberty Tree and Edward Bennett, the abolitionist. And by a miracle, the stump of the tree was left on Frederick Douglass Avenue, and a new sapling has grown out of the tree. And Harbor One Bank just gave us a little grant, and we spruced up the area and got rid of the poison ivy around the tree. <laughs> So we're hoping that this traveling exhibit might find another um, home between now and the end of the year. And before we start our formal program, I'm going to introduce Rachel Zyrick, mm -hmm. who is the librarian at Massasoit Community College. Yes. Um, it's just going to be a couple of minutes. Um, my name is Rachel. I've been at Massasoit for four years. I know I have a, um, a retired professor and an alumna from Massasoit. Is that anyone else oh, gone? Alum? Alum? Okay, excellent. So we've got some Massasoit people in the house. Um, I've been there for a few years, and every year we put on a program called the One Book, One Community Program. Um, this year, what we do is we bring in an author to um, speak to the students and to the community about uh, different topics. This year, our speaker is Dr. Monique Morris, who wrote a book called Push Out, and it's about the criminalization of black girls in education. So um, there's actually, have you heard of the school to prison pipeline? People heard of this social phenomena where um, Within the educational systems, a lot of the disciplinary um, um, programs that they have there tend to get people out of the schools um, and to get them institutionalized so they go from the school into um, prison. Um, usually this is focused in upon for young men um, this woman decided that she needed to um, reveal what was happening to young black women in this country, young black girls in this country. Just today, as a matter of fact, um, a young girl in Louisiana got sent home because she had the wrong hairdo. Um, so it's those kinds of things, regular behaviors, tantrums um, that under other circumstances or if they were home, um, would someone would get sent to their room. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. what's happening today with um, these very strict policies um, is that girls are getting disciplined um, and going into detention centers based on um, some of these behavioral problems. And it also ends up that a lot of these women, um, a lot of these girls, they're not women, a lot of these girls um, come from backgrounds which are so, um, do not support a, 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 a good lifestyle, mm -hmm. so um, a positive lifestyle. So um, 
This year we're having multiple speakers every month. We're starting off on September 23rd, I believe it is, it's a Tuesday. Claire Cronin is going to come to Massasoit and speak about um, the reform legislation that came through this year um, for criminal justice and there will be a variety of other programs culminating in the author visit in April. So I'd like to thank you for giving me a couple of moments of your time to tell you about it. You're all welcomed. There will be posters up here. We're, we're getting them. You'll have, they'll be around um, probably by next week. Okay? And if you have any questions, you can contact me. My name, I'm the only Rachel in the library. You can just go to the Massasoit Library and look for, for my name, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rachel. So it's great, with great pleasure that I want to introduce our feature speaker for this evening. Gary L. Highlander earned his PhD from Boston College. He has had stints as a history professor at Stonehill at Framingham State. He's an independent thinker, an independent scholar. He's given talks on a wide range of topics Eisenhower's America, the GI Bill, the real pilgrims, the sale of witch trials, and I'll tell you how I'm connection, connected uh, to the Goodale family in Salem. But his topic today is really on Frederick Douglass and his life's work. We know that one of Douglass's um, favorite or most um, famous sayings is, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. And I recently attended a lecture in New Bedford where they talked about abolitionists and they asked the question, are you an ally or are you an accomplice? Accomplice, how engaged would you have been in the struggle for freedom? We just had a group of young people from the Brockton Area Workforce Investment Board WAVE program take civil rights words and mm -hmm. sayings and um, wonderful quotes and did original artwork and created a pathway to justice in the Frederick Douglass Garden. So your talk this evening is terrific and apropos. So may I introduce to everyone Dr. Gary Hyde. Well, thank you. <clears throat> and uh, thank you, and thank you, thank you all for coming this evening. And uh, good evening, Brockton, and whomever else is uh, linking in with this. I'd, li I'd like to begin, I'm, I was, as I was sitting here, I'm, I was looking at the, the photographs here of Frederick Douglass, and if you come on in, nobody's late. Nobody's late. Nobody has to stay after school because I have to get to bed. The, that, and I'm going to trip on this, and that's all that you're going to remember. That I was noticing here that, you know, Frederick Douglass, if you look at the photographs, he never smiled. And that was done deliberately. And, and the reason for that, he said, if I smile, think people will believe that I was happy as a slave and that I'm happy in these, in these present circumstances. So he deliberately always looked rather grim and stoical and hand on hip. And I'm looking here without struggle, you know, there is no progress. And one of his phrases was agitate, agitate, agitate. We have, every individual has three boxes, and he's talking all of us. Every individual has three boxes, a ballot box, a jury box, and a cartridge box. And he was not a violent man. But see, when, when one speaks or when one writes threes, the use of three is an interesting, it's a great way to write, isn't it? And to use three examples. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to recommend, if you haven't read, and this is, this is the edition I like, it's all here. It's so, I mean, he, this is his, this is where he came of age. Uh, as a man, as an intellectual, as an abolitionist, as a self-actualization. This is his story. And this is the first of three, three autobiographies. And I, I always assign, well, when I use it, I assign this one. It was written in 1845. And, I, and the reason for that, I think it's the most authentic because it was written short, shortly after he fled from Talbot County in Maryland or escaped ran away, whatever verb you wanted. He self-liberated himself is what he did. I mean, that's the right phrase. And, and this was written in 45, and the others were written much later in his life, and they, lack, they don't lack the immediacy, but this was, 
This was as he remembered it, just seven years later. It's like when you're being interviewed for an event or in a witness, and your memory gets a little cloudy, or people were at the table that were not there, or you imagine conversations that never took place. To me, this is authentic. And what I'd like to do, and please stop me as we go through this, because I'm, I'm not thinking out loud with you, but in terms of Frederick Douglass, abolitionist, Frederick Douglass, world diplomat, Frederick Douglass, a supporter of women's rights. Uh, he broke with uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Uh, he also broke with the man who introduced him to the New Bedford Nantucket audience, and that's William Lloyd Garrison. And, and he also broke with John Brown. I'm just laying things out here. John Brown's raid, uh, he wanted no part of John Brown's raid, and I'll get into all of that as we walk through our, our conversation you know, together. And here is a world-class figure, a world historical figure who struggled. He did not even know his birthday. And in terms of self-actualization, I just want to share this with you, that for Frederick Douglass and Frederick Bailey, I know that, and later on he took the name, you know, Douglass, that he spoke for so many so many black men and women, and people new to the country, you know, that being able to master the language, to be able to read, and to be able to write, and to know your birthday, that makes you a person, doesn't it? That here is my name, and I can sign my name, and I recognize my name. Because you see that his legal status, you know, as, a, as an enslaved person and others, you know, four million in the, uh, in the slave south, his legal status was that of chattel property. And, and that's an old biblical word derived from cattle, that you were property, you were property. You, one does not need a last name, one, because you're not gonna get any mail, you're not gonna get any phone calls, uh, you're not gonna be served an indictment, that you only need a first name, or you're someone's, he's, Fred's Lloyd or Lloyd's Fred or whatever, that one doesn't need a name. And for Douglas, you know, when he learned to, when, you know, Mrs. Ald began to teach him his letters and to be very careful, she stopped doing that after a while, to teach him his letters, his, as he said, my A's and B's and C's, and teaching him how to write short words of three or four letters. It's a beginning. But for him to be able to write, and then to be able to write my name and identify myself, this is me, this is me. And now I have a birthday. You know, I came into this world on this date. He never knew. And that's why I put down on our, you know, on our flyer, Circa, you know, Circa, 1818. He guessed it was 1818 from bits and pieces of conversation he had picked up from his masters and it was always masters, was it? It picked up from his masters. And depending on, depending on the autobiography, it was January, February, or March of 1818. It, it mattered to him, when was I born? What is my name? I want a last name. How do I spell my name? And, and certainly, and certainly, you know, how to, how to read. For many former slaves, and, and, and Douglas was involved in the Freedmen Society, you know, after, after the war between the states. I prefer that term, the war between the states. Only be, I'm okay. I can say the Civil War in Brockton, Massachusetts, but you know, if you go below, if you go below the Mason-Dixon line, you know, it better be the war between the states. And if one goes into Mississippi or Alabama, it better be the war of northern aggression. In Florida, you know, Florida in, too. In Florida too, the war of northern aggression, you damn Yankees. And I'm from Illinois. So I always had to be careful before I, had my, before I moved over and had my Massachusetts license, because I'm from the land of Lincoln, and that got me two speeding tickets. <laughs> yeah. And you pay as you go. And it wasn't like, cut a check. And but that's another story for another night with, an, with another topic. To be able to read, to be able to write, to know my name, to know my birthday, that gave me manhood. You know, that made me a person. As an abolitionist, and, and this is interesting, that he was a very ardent abolitionist, but, you, but his concerns were 
when he, when he fled, when he fled from Maryland, that in that first autobiography, and only later on in the 1880s does he provide some details, that he was concerned that if I talk too much about how abolitionists work, it'll tip off the owners, it'll tip off the masters, you know, they'll be on their guard. So he was quite careful in not laying out, in not providing names, and, and, and certainly not laying out how he was able to, to get out of Maryland. It was by, by rail, it was by water, and getting, up to New, and getting up to New York, and so concerned that in New York, you know, that he would be grabbed, you know, that the alls would come looking for him, because one was never safe. You know, until, well, until the Emancipation Proclamation. You know, one was never safe. So to, to able to have an identity and to be able to witness, he was so careful here. He tells us this. I, I do not want to exaggerate because I'll play right into the hands of those who say that slavery is a positive good. It's a natural condition for African Americans or for the Negro, if you will. And I, I do not want to overplay my hand. What is here is true. You have my word as a man, because I know those who oppose abolitionists will say he's exaggerating, he's exaggerating, he's exaggerating. And one of the themes that runs through slavery, one of the themes that runs through all of Frederick Douglass's work is violence, violence, the whip, the cudgel, not the possibility of, not the possibility of, of violence, not the possibility of being whipped or struck or, or hit with a cudgel. It was the certainty, the certainty. And depending on the master, that one is better off, one is better off punishing for a minor crime because then the larger ones won't happen. You know, if we get you for a minor infraction, for example, you looked at me, to, you gave me a look, you gave me the eye, you had an attitude, you talked back to me. That, as I said, you made eye contact with me to make certain that the small offenses are addressed to prevent larger offenses. It's a violent institution. The only way to suppress people's natural inclination is through violence and fear. And part of that fear, as a family man, well, he didn't marry until he came to, you know, to the north, but part of that fear, if, if, to, be, to be sold down the river. And we use that phrase today, don't we? To be sold down the river it comes from slave days. And to be sold down the river meant that my wife is sold down the river, or I am sold down the river because of my insolence, and separated from my wife, from my children, you know, for all days. You know, meant one of the, in the aftermath of the, I'll say the Civil War because we're in Massachusetts, <laughs> to, there were so many men and women who, with the end of the war, took to the streets, took to the roads, because they were free. They could walk, and they walked to see if they could find a missing spouse or missing children. And most often, it never happened, or if it did, they'd already remarried, a second family, and so on, um, to be sold down the river. And as, as, as property, as property, Douglas remembers being sold, didn't he? With the death of one of his masters, the property is all, it's like a, like a yard sale. And he talks about this. He's not, he's not angry. He said, this is what it is. And you know, my, my owner has died, there's a breakup of the estate, and we were all lined up. Men, women, old and young, the sheep, the cows, the, the farming utensils, and we were all bid on. We were all bid on, as I said, like chattel property. Violence, how about the violence directed toward women? It was, some of these topics are unpleasant. I mean, race is so central to American history, it truly is. Uh, I mean, long before the Pilgrims landed, uh, there were um, African Americans you know, being, being brought up the Chesapeake into Jamestown. I mean, race is so central to this country, but the violence directed toward women, you know, being whipped and, and, and being raped, there was, not to be offensive, but a white man could not be charged with rape in most cases because it's someone else's property. You can be charged with molestation, 
You can be charged with violation, but not rape, because this woman is not, she's not, she doesn't have a first name and a last name. She's not a citizen. Violence. The, the breaking up of families. The, the use of the overseer and the overseers. And there's no, and it's hard for me, it's hard for anyone today to give a generalized discussion about how each plantation was run. They were run differently, like every household is run differently. And, and overseers were brought in to make sure the work got done and also to break slaves, to break a man, to break a woman. He remembers, he remembers the slave breaker, Kovi, and he was farmed out to the slave breaker to break him of his insolence. He was difficult. He was a bit argumentative. He gave you the look, and we can't have that come up. It's, and went to Kobe, and Kobe had a reputation of being a slave breaker, and he was vicious and violent, and he tried to break Frederick Douglass, and he said that he almost broke me to the point that I wanted to take my life, you know, that I would never be free, ever, ever. He almost broke me, and then I rallied, and when he came for me that time again, he was 16, and he came for me, you know, with the cudgel, with the rope to tie me and whip me and beat me. I challenged him and we fought for hours and I wouldn't give up and I nailed him, I licked him, I licked him and he finally let me go and he never touched me again. From that time on, I licked him, I beat him fair and fair and square, man to man. And, and for Covey, he never talked about it. He said, I know why he didn't talk about it because he made his living as a slave breaker. And if the word get out among the community that he couldn't whip this 16-year-old insolent kid, I'm out of business. Said, so I broke him, he didn't break me. Because he needed to keep you know, his, his position as a professional slave breaker. Violence, depending on the overseer, depending on the overseer, when the horn blew in the morning, you know, working from sunup to sundown, the last one out of the slave quarters, you got the lash, or you got to blow off the back of the head. You're getting up too late. You got to move, 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 move. Nutrition, nutrition, corn, mush, corn, pork. Pork was seen as a high energy meat. And clothing, you know, in Lawrence and Lowell, and in New Bedford, and in Fall River, I mean, everyone was complicit in slavery to some extent. Slave traders, uh, that if you were involved in textiles and that that cotton came up from the, uh, from the south. There were grades of cotton, you see, grades of cotton cloth, just like there's grades of tobacco. Uh, grades of cotton, Egyptian cotton. I like to buy my shirts Egyptian cotton. It's good cotton. But there was a, there was a grade of cotton that was called Negro cotton, Negro cloth, because it was so poorly made. Uh, later on, that Negro cloth was used to make the uniforms for northern armies, and it was called it was. It was Lawrence and Lowell, top price. We're going we're gonna to lowball you on the, uh, on the quality. We're going to charge you top price. It was called shoddy. We use that word today, don't we? Shoddy cloth, shoddy cotton, because it fell apart on the soldiers' backs. It fell, on the, fell apart in the rain. So the nutrition level was dreadful. And in order to, in, in order to, to, you know, to provide s s s some, some, he's always taught we're always hungry. We're always hungry. And, you know, Colonel, Colonel Lloyd, one of the finest gardens in, in Maryland, you know, to keep people out of the garden, because folks are slipping in all the time, stealing, because they're hungry. They're not stealing, they're hungry. And for my wife and for my children, that all the fences were tarred in pitch, and anyone that had any pitch on their clothing, you were near my garden, and you're going to get whipped, it's power, it's authority, it's fear. I'm gonna get him into the North in a minute. Religion, well, there were different ways to teach religion, depending on the preacher, depending on the owner. Sometimes he pinch hit for the preacher. Now they would talk about there were two creations. The first was a, black, a white creation, and then a black creation. It speaks for itself, number one, number two and that how religion was used by the masters to justify 
the violence of slavery. We're doing this for your own good, to keep you in line. Jesus told us, Jesus told us, slaves be obedient to your masters. And the more that you're obedient, the greater your reward will be in the next world. It sounds like the pitch given to, to workers during the Industrial Revolution, remember that? And Karl Marx said, they're controlling you with religion. The masters, the preachers, they're controlling you with religion. And, you know, Douglas was a religious man. You know, when he came north, he became a preacher, or he was licensed as a preacher, a religious man, and believing in the full equality of everyone. But he wrote a scathing essay against the Southern spin on religion. It's all about fear, violence, and subservience. And the most religious, he would say, the most religious master is the most dangerous because he has the Lord's privilege, if you will, the right privilege, you know, to be able to discipline. And there are two creations. And the greater you, the more you suffer here, the greater will be your reward in the, in the next life. So slaves, be obedient to your masters. So it's religion, it's violence, it's terror, it's nutrition. It's, it's I'll never be free. And to learn to read and to learn to write and to be able to cipher so I know when I'm being cheated. And I have, after the Civil War when, and during the Freedmen's going to market and to know what the value is of tobacco, cotton, rice, whatever's being harvested, I know money, I'm not being cheated. And hey, we all know this is true. It's true today. It's always true. When you know you've been wronged in your heart of hearts, in the 3 a.m. of your soul, and you know you've been wronged, and you have no recourse, you have no one to make it right, you have no one to fix or to speak for you or to intercede for you, that builds anger, it builds resentment, doesn't it? It makes you violent. Maybe, maybe it, it, it grows into drinking or gambling or whatever. But to have no re recourse and your property, you have no right to go into court. You cannot testify against a white man. You cannot bring an indictment. Your property, you have no last name. And, and Douglas, at the age of 12, you know, began to lament. He, he's guessing he's 12. He began to lament the fact that I'll, I'll, never, I'll never be free. Now, he had heard the word abolition. But he didn't know what it meant. But he knew it was something that the planter class feared. And he knew it was a, a word that maybe had freedom in it. But he wasn't quite sure. And he went to a dictionary. And he couldn't figure it out, because he hadn't learned yet how to use a dictionary. And when Mrs. Auld, he said, one of the, one, he said not only does slavery diminish the person enslaved, it also diminishes the mistress and the master because you become brutal, you become oppressive. And Mrs. Auld was such a beautiful woman, I looked right into her face and she, smiling and, and teaching me my A's and my B's and my C's. And then Mr. Auld said, stop doing that. If you teach how to read and write, they'll be unhappy, they'll be miserable, you're gonna have trouble with them and they're gonna run. And this is an investment. And so stop it. And she became so vicious. And he remembered when she would catch him looking at a newspaper, you know, trying to figure the words out, you know, to rip it out of his hands. And we don't want this. Stop it. And, and Douglas began to very carefully work the young white boys in the area when he moved to Baltimore. Letters, letters, how to make letters, how to make words. And he never revealed the names of them. He said, I know who they are. And I remember where they lived. They lived on these streets. And uh, they, taught me, they taught me letters with pieces of chalk when, and building a ship. And that goes here and that piece goes over there. And how to begin to put things together. <clears throat> he was self-taught. And now how do I escape? How do I escape? It, be it became, I need to get out. And when he finally moved to Baltimore, Oh, and by the way, I should mention this as well, that the masters would set traps. One of, Captain, uh, 
Colonel Lloyd was one of his masters. And the rumor was he had over a thousand slaves, you know, scattered among dozens of plantations. And that the trick of some of these guys, and he said, and, and, and Colonel Lloyd would pull this trick, you know, that he'd be riding and there'd be, you know, a group of, of black men walking. And he would simply stop and say, uh, who's, your, who's your owner? Where's your, where's your master? Where's your pass? Where are you going? Who's your owner? And they would say, well, well uh, Captain Lloyd, Captain Lloyd, is he, is he good to you? And if, he said, you have no idea who you're talking to. It will be them, the owner. And you better say, who treats me very well because if you say no, he'll recognize you and you're going to get a whipping that night. Or you might be sold down the river, so you lie, you dissemble. My master is, my master is wonderful to me. And as Douglas said, to be, to be the victim of a poor master is dreadful. You know, moving to Baltimore, it was, a new, it was a, new, a, a new universe in Baltimore. People were freer. There were free black men and women in Baltimore. You know, and, and the quality of life was better. People dressed better. They spoke to each other better. And in Baltimore, to see those ships, and here's, and here's a metaphor from him. He didn't know what a metaphor was. But to see these ships on the sea with their white sails and being free and being able to sail, I want my soul to be able to sail, to be free. And that's in his head. How do I make that happen? How do I leave Baltimore? I, you know, I have no idea. I, I know there's a New York up there. Canada, I have no idea where that is. And of course, the Underground Railroad, they very quickly came to realize that, that if, in many cases, that one had to literally leave the country uh, because slave catchers, the Constitution protected slave catchers, that the federal government was in the business of, of, of helping folks capture runaways, particularly after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1950, of 1850, rather, 1950, of 1850. It was called the, the Rendition Clause. It's right in the Constitution. And some of you who know me know I don't leave home without it, do I, right? I always have a copy somewhere on me whether a suit coat, a sport coat, or a pair of dungarees, this is my talisman, this is my rabbit foot. I always have a copy of the Constitution with me. It's great reading. It's just, just the movement of a, just a semicolon or a comma changes the meaning of a word. You know, the 14th Amendment, you know, which is one of the Civil War Amendments that Frederick Douglass fully supported in that first paragraph. The 14th Amendment, the first paragraph, is the most litigated amendment in, in, in the country today. And just, just for a word, it talks about the privileges or immunities of citizenship. Now, to me, the word or makes them two different things. What are the privileges or the immunities? And let's complement them. And that 14th Amendment, 1868, and Douglas cheered it. I don't mean to jump around, but his, his, his biography is like this. It's like an oil slick. I mean, it, it, it's like trying to capture the wind. That 14th Amendment, the who are citizens, for the first time black men and women are citizens, as are Indians, and also, and also native-born Americans for sure, but everyone is entitled to the privileges or immunities of citizenship, due process, it's a great phrase, isn't it? wonderful phrase, talk about anticipatory language, due process, and equal protection of the laws. And that depends on time, place, and circumstance, doesn't it? And it, it, and it won't be until the 14th Amendment you know, that the states must provide also for due process, equal protection of the laws, and the privileges or immunities of citizenship. It's a free, great phrase. I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll get to that, yeah. The president believed that there was a constitutional right. I, I'll get to that. Okay. I'm, I'm right there, okay? I want to get him out. Okay. But I, I want you to know his life. You know, as I can, how do we know someone else's life? You know, as best as I can share it, absorb it, by reading his narrative, the first. And I accept that as the most genuine. There's no attempt to go back and polish it up and rewrite it. We all do that, don't we? You go back and you rewrite things. 
Remember, the Adams children rewrote the, di rewrote the letters of, of Abigail because she couldn't spell. <laughs> and I want to be able to, for posterity, believe that my mother could spell. And she wrote in run-on sentences in a stream of consciousness. We've got to clean all that up. Mother would not be happy because this is her authentic, authentic authenticity. He learned, when he learned to write, he learned to write passes and to learn the script, the handwriting of his masters, the way they form the letters. That's clever. That's clever. And, be, and, and the first time he and a few others tried to run, one of the group ratted them out. See, this was always a problem. House slaves would rat out field hands. That way you maintain your privileged position. You know? Speaking of a privileged position, Covey, and this is true, breeder women. I bought a woman to be a breeder woman, you know, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to mate her, you know, with a male from another plantation, and we will share the offspring, and we will make money by breeding young slaves or young black, black, black boys and young black girls. And, and, and that was a very common practice, as was, as was, and this went right to the heart of the marriage, miscegenation, dad going down to the slave quarters, property, my property, his children going down to the slave quarters and, and fathering children, and the mistress of the home wanted them out, out. Favoritism, it's, it, it, it's the, that child, I see that child every day, is a product of my husband's lust or my children, my son's lust, sold down the river. He escapes finally. He frees himself, self-liberation, in, in 1838. He doesn't give us the details. He gives us the details in the 1880s. I boarded a train. I had a sailor's outfit on because there were many free blacks who were sailors. I have a sailor's outfit on, a sailor's cap, a sailor's ascot, and a pass that I've written. And I boarded a train that was moving. Now that's a little dangerous. And I wanted to board a train that was moving because if I boarded it when it was, at, when it was stationary, the conductor would ask for a pass. And he might look at it a little more carefully. But if I board the train while, I'm, while, it's, while it's moving, and I'm already on board, and he says, who are you? I don't remember you coming on board. Do you have a pass? Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, here. But my real pass is back on my ship. You know, I'm going up the Delaware River. You know, I'm going to New York. He said, and, I, and I pulled that off. And I pulled that off. And, you know, his, you know, his, his, his first wife, and he was married several times. This is, this is great. This is Douglas. When people complain, uh, you know, my, my first wife, my first wife, yeah, was, was the color of my mother, and my second wife was the color of my father. See, he always believed that he was fathered by one of his white masters, and he probably was, but how would he know? It's not like he has a birth certificate. So he flees, and he goes to New York, fearful of New York, too many, too many slave catchers in New York. I'm not comfortable. Uh, I could be grabbed, I could be sent back. The, now, the Fugitive Slave Act is not on the books yet, but the, uh, the, the rendition clause is on the books, and there's money, you know, there, there's money for a, a reward for capturing a runaway. That's why some folks went to Canada. And he wound up, as you know, you know, he wound up in, in Massachusetts, in New Bedford, and later on went up to Lynn, and later on to Rochester, New York. He wound up in, in, in New Bedford, and now he's Frederick Douglass with two S's. I wish I had a good story as to why he put two S's on it. I don't know. It's just that the name Douglas was in a poem. And, and, and someone recommended, Ruggles, a man by the name of Ruggles, that helped, he had a safe house, that David Ruggles, that helped spirit him out of New York. That uh, it was the Lady of the Lake. It was lady the, the, lake. the Lady of the Lake. And so Ruggles had been reading The Lady of the Lake. And he just said, you know, he, he became, he went from Bailey to Johnson. And he's in New York, there are too, there are too, and then they wrote New Bedford, there are too many Johnsons around. So I need, a, I need a name that's my name. So, and he said, how about Douglas with two S's? Our Lady of the Lake. And so he's Frederick Douglas with two S's, forever 
Mr. Tacos. Mr. Tacos are 200. And he met, he met William Lloyd Garrison, the Liberator. He said that when I took a subscription to the Liberator, he said it was the second most important book in my life, the first being the Bible, to be able to read the spirit of the Liberator. And that, and that talking about, and this is, and, 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 <clears throat> talking about slavery, is a, it's an immorality. I, I have forgotten Lincoln. Slavery is an immorality. It's a theft. You, you steal my life. You steal my children's life. You steal my labor. You steal my future. You steal me. It's immoral. And it will be, it will be garrison. See, th there were a number of different brands, blends of abolitionism. And Garrison talked about immediatism, you know, that there's no compromise with slavery. It's immoral, it's wrong. So he quarreled deeply with those who talked about gradualism. In other words, we will gradually free all black men and women who, and they picked a date. It would be like July 4th, 1840. Anyone born after July 4th, 1840, at the age of 21, you're a free man, a free woman. And they would pick a date, gradualism, so that everybody got accustomed to it. And, 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 for, and no, absolutely not. It's wrong. Now, immediatism. And don't talk about compensatory gradualism. In other words, the, you know, the, the, whatever the market value was, compensatory mar uh, gradualism. If anybody should be paid, it should be the black man, the black woman, to be paid. And whatever the, whatever the well, I don't mean to be disrespectful, the going rate. Yeah, I mean, at, the, at the time of the Civil War, a prime field hand went for 2,400 bucks. And in today's money, it's about the price of a uh, Toyota, an LE. And, 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 what, and, the, and what commanded the highest price? A prime female, 14 or 15, breeder, children. And the more children you produce, there's the verb, the better your food, the better your accommodations, no field work. You know, the, the, the better you are, the better your clothing. It was a whole insidious system. Douglas makes it to New Bedford. And he, and he meets, he meets the, the, the liberator. He meets, he meets him, um, Garrison. And Garrison says, would you like to speak? You know, would you like to give voice to your experiences? You need to share it. You need to be a tribune. We need to spread the spirit of abolitionism. And remember with me, I mean, I teach history, uh, that abolitionists were always a small minority in the North. They were seen as being trouble, bad for peace, bad for prosperity, um, bad for unification, always seen as troublemakers. And, and it, will be, it, will be gar it will be Garrison, you know, who will educate coach up, you know, co coach up Douglas, that we must remember Socrates. We must remember Socrates. That is to say, Socrates, Socrates, Socrates said to, to, the, to the youth of Athens, if you want change, you must, he didn't say agitate, you must sting like a horsefly. Sting. If you write, recommend, if you sign proclamations and protest, that's all well and good, but you need to gain attention. You must, you must sting like a horsefly. Do not go away. Agitate agitate, agitate. It's right up there. Without struggle, without conflict, there is no progress. And, it's, and Douglas said, I, I'm not prepared to speak publicly. I'm fearful. I've never done this before. Tell your story, Frederick. Tell your story, Mr. Douglas. Tell it as you lived it and remember it. And he gave him the stage. And, and Douglas warmed to the occasion. And there were many who said, he, he was never a slave. He's too educated. He's too well-spoken. You know, he's too articulate. He's too well-dressed. He's a fraud. And that's when he became that national orator, you see. Later on, he became a minister. Frederick Douglas was a, a thoughtful man. He wasn't impulsive. He broke with William Lloyd Garrison. See, Garrison was in the habit of burning the Constitution, that it was a covenant with the devil for two reasons. One, it had a rendition clause, 
where you know, one could get, go north and bring back a runaway. And also, and I'll, I know you remember this, the notorious three-fifths clause, yeah. all right? That you know, in terms of representation in, in the House of Representatives and in the Electoral College, you know, that, you know, you count the population three-fifths, you know, every, every um, five slaves equal three white votes for, for House seats in the House and also for the elect Electoral College. That helped to elect two out, of three, two out of three slaveholders to the presidency until Lincoln. Now, there was a fourth position on abolitionism. The first was immediatism. The second was gradual emancipation. The third was compensatory emancipation. And the fourth one was recolonization, back to Africa, back to Africa. That was always the white man's option. And, and Lincoln, for the longest time, believed in recolonization, you know, that there's no way socially blacks and whites can live together. They, it's wrong to steal someone's life, their economy, their labor, but socially, no, back to Africa. Lincoln dropped that later on. Or if it wasn't back to Africa, it might be back to an island in the, in the Caribbean. You know, for a while, there was some thought about annexing Santo Domingo. And, and Congress wanted no part of that. And, and Douglas was listening to Santo Domingo. Now, maybe some of us can relocate to Santo Domingo, you know, and have our own nation, just like um, in, uh, in West Africa. Liberia. You know, the capital of, help me here. Monrovia. Like Monrovia. I mean, it's named after James Monroe, slaveholder. Yeah, yes. I can't believe that hasn't been changed. It's, it's been the American, it's been since 1835, the American Colonization Society. With the outbreak of the war, oh, well, let me back up for a second. He was well, so, that, uh, pardon me? Garrison was uh, one of those who believed in colonization. Initially. Yes, yes, yes. And then there was immediatism. Yeah. And he broke with Garrison, because Garrison burning the Constitution said the Constitution is a sinful pact made with the devil. And, and Douglas, we can work within the Constitution. Don't be so radical, don't be so hasty. With patience, he said, I'm willing to talk with slaveholders. I'm willing to talk across the aisle, to use a cliche. I'm willing to talk to anyone to be able to embrace the message, I'll get to this, of his very last major address. It's called the lesson of the hour. Let me close with that in a little bit. The lesson of the hour, right before he passed. He passed in, in 1895 at the age of 77, a heart attack in Rochester, New York. He broke with Garrison. We need to work with the Constitution. That, we need to accept the fact there is a vast white majority here and we need to talk to everybody. Now. He's going to break with Susan B. Anthony, and he's going to break with uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton over the issue of the 15th Amendment, black men to vote. Douglas went to the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, and this was part of the reform movement of the 1830s and the 1840s, of which abolitionism was one along with women's rights and temperance, uh, world peace, and uh, reforms in uh, reform schools. Rather than throwing young men and women in with the general prison population, all you do is make veteran prisoners. You know, you need to reform them. That's why it's called a reform school. And Douglas went to Seneca Falls, and he spoke, and he supported the Seneca Falls Declaration. And if you haven't had the chance to read it, it's beautiful. These women were so clever. I know you know where I'm going. They took the model of the Declaration of Independence and all they did was flip it around a little bit. And rather than he being the king, he being white men. And that we, that we cannot be properly educated, we cannot vote. Uh, that we cannot file for divorce. You know, that we cannot, we cannot go to medical school. And so it's a beautiful document and they flip it wonderfully. And, and Douglas supports that. He's there. He speaks. I wonder what kind of, you know, I've often wondered what the sound of his voice was. I want him to sound like Harry Belafonte or something. Yeah. You know, a great, deep, reassuring, 
mellifluous voice. Yeah. We'll never know, will we? Oh, and he broke with... There's no record? Pardon me? There's no record of... Oh, no, no, much too early. The closest you're going to get... The only... When Thomas Edison figured out a way to make a, a, a wax disc, you begin to get some voices, but they're very scratchy. They're very inauthentic. The, the first one that I've heard, there are two I've heard, you know, Woodrow Wilson and Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt needed, sounded like he needed more testosterone. I mean, he really, <laughs> I mean, he just did not have, he did not have a good pres. I'm sorry, I'm a voice guy. Yeah, yeah, he does, yeah, uh, high, high squeaky. Yeah, then, you heard it too, right? Yeah, I heard it, but Booker T. Washington is also recorded. Yes, yes, yes right. You know, Booker T. Washington, just a word about him, that he didn't write up from slavery until 1891. And, 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 and he and Douglas uh, really did not see eye to eye. I mean, he's talking about something altogether different than Douglas's in Up From Slavery. Uh, it's an interesting book, and it speaks to the moment as he viewed the moment. And, and remember, Douglas, not Douglas, Booker T. Washington remembered when the day of Jubilee came. He was seven or eight when the word came that the, the war was over and the master reading the Emancipation Proclamation and you're free to go or you're free to stay here. And most of these black men and women, boy, they were freed, penniless, friendless, without, without literacy, and at the anger of a defeated white self because of you. Because of you, my boys are dead. Because of you, my husband's dead. Because of you, my plantation's been burned. But that's another conversation for Reconstruction, the Freedmen's Bureau, and all of that. He broke with Anthony, and he broke with Elizabeth Cady Stanton because he was willing to accept the 15th Amendment, the right to vote for black men only. So I'm willing to accept that. It's a start. It's a start. We have to start somewhere. You know, and if you insist on black women, you're going to kill it. You're going to kill the proposal. And so he broke with them over that issue. He said, it will come. You know, when the 19th Amendment came, when the 19th Amendment came in the way up the road, and there were marches, and black women marched, in order not to offend lawmakers in 1918, 1919, the black women were told to march at the, at the, at the, at the back of the parade. You know, it's like being at the back of the bus because we don't want to offend lawmakers. We need their vote. The vote's for you, but you've got to be invisible. Go to the back of the bus. You know, go to the back of the line. And that's another story for, for, for another. He, so he broke with Stanton, and he broke with him. He broke with Susan B. Anthony. You know, Stanton got herself in big trouble, huge trouble. She wrote her version of the Bible, Guess who? <laughs> it was because of Adam we got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. You know, you, you guys, you men, have completely distorted the story. Boy, did she get in trouble for doing that. Uh, and we all know that Jefferson wrote his copy of the Bible. Maybe you've seen that, Jefferson's Bible. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, Jefferson's Bible is very interesting. And, and that he said, you know, Jesus was a real man, but he wasn't the Redeemer. You know, he was the greatest prophet. And these miracles, they're all made up. They're all made up. He was a great preacher. You know, that he, he was the, maybe the, 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 the greatest prophet, but the rest is a little bit. But that's, it's interesting how stuff goes. So, so Douglas, Douglas supported Grant for election in 1868 because Grant, Grant was trying to ride herd on the Klan and also, the, and also with early civil rights legislation. It did not help too much, but at least he supported Grant. And he also, he also he didn't run. He was placed on a, uh, as vice president on the ticket with, um, I've forgotten her first name, Woodhull. Woodhull. And, what was the first name? Virginia. Virginia Woodhull. And he never even showed up for the convention. And they just tie, they put him onto the ticket because he would you know, draw votes. Somehow, he became a minister, not a minister, became an envoy to, to Haiti, to, uh, to Santo Domingo, uh, the, the uh, Dominican Republic. Uh, and as he began to slow, he had five children, by the way, and as he began to slow down, and he did 
slow down when he, I'm coming to Lincoln again. You know, when he fled to Ireland and then he fled to Great Britain, he did so. He was gone for two years because he feared that the slave catchers were looking for him. Because when this, when this was published, it was, na it was a national book. I mean, it, it went through 10 or 12 editions. It was published in other languages. And the name Ald is there, one of his owners, the Ald family. And he's going to come looking for me. And I got to get out of here. It's funny. You got to get out of here. You're a marked man. They know you're here. You mentioned the name. They'll figure you out. They'll find you. Go to Ireland. Then you go to England. Let things cool down. And he did. And of course, obviously, he returned in the war. Lincoln was disappointed. He was disappointed in Lincoln. In 1864, he did not vote for Lincoln. He's the white man's president. That's what he said. That's what he, that's what he said. He was disappointed because Lincoln was unwilling. He was slow to recognize using black soldiers, to use black men to help fight. And Lincoln was slow to do that. And Lincoln was slow to do that because he knew that was such a minority position, that black men will not be good soldiers. They will cut and run. They will throw their weapons down. And reluctantly, and this, maybe you might have a question on this later on, it wasn't until September of 1862, in the aftermath of the Battle of Antietam, that Lincoln issued what he called, or what was called, the Preliminary, preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. He was willing to li live with slavery. Hear me well. The Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, September 1862. The Battle of Antietam was a draw. Lee was pushed out of Maryland, and McClellan was eventually relieved of command. Lincoln had manpower problems. Um, the drafts were not, the, the draft, uh, not enough men were enlisting. The draft was unpopular. The war was unpopular. I need manpower. And he wrote the, he wrote the preliminary emancipation proclamation, and here's what it said. If you, 11 states of the Confederacy, do not lay down your arms by January 1, the new year, by January 1, 1863, this preliminary emancipation proclamation becomes permanent. But it only applies to those states that are in rebellion. Very carefully drawn. It's not a moving document at all. It does not apply to those slave states that have not left the Union. The, Kentucky, Missouri, Delaware, we, we tend to forget that Delaware was a slave state. Kentucky, Missouri, Delaware, and Maryland. Boy, if I lose Maryland, I'm going to have to relocate the capital. It's surrounded on three sides. And he, he was concerned about that. We're going to have to relocate it to Philadelphia, to New York. So in September of 1862, when you look at it, with the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, he was willing to restore the Union with slavery. But in January of 1863, that in those states that are presently in rebellion, slaves are henceforth and forever free. And he told them not to act out, to act in a lawful manner. And when you hear the boom of Union artillery, and when you hear the, the trump, 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 I shouldn't say that. No. When, when, <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's a when, 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 so I, I just can't help myself. When, 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 when you spot Union forces marching, run into their lines, because my generals have been instructed not to return you. Run into their lines. Because up until then, there was no policy that if a family ran into Union lines, sometimes they would be returned, or, 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 or they would be used um, as, as, as workers in the field. Run into Union lines, and after that, we're running into Union lines. And you are henceforth and forever free. And at that point, you could enlist. The film Glory deals with that, doesn't it? And that's a wonderful film. And nine-tenths of it is correct. Oh, yeah, it, 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 Spielberg can do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. and, and it's OK. I have something I, I, I do on the side with, with, with groups. And I call it Real History, R-E-E-L. And I do some films. And I'll do about a 10 or 15 minute clip of a film on history. And I'll say, okay, let's talk about the history and let's see how it played out 
in the movies. So I, I like to do that, and you know, it's a three or four part series, and I keep moving the films around. I do, um, I do High Noon, The Cold War. You know what's really fun? The Wizard of Oz. Because oh, no, uh, that's got, when you dig down, when you, when you take a deep dive into The Wizard of Oz, there's other stuff going on. It's great fun. And, and I, I like doing it because like people like movies. And they like to talk about movies. And I say, watch this. So you've never, watch this. So right now, I'm going to stop it. Now watch what's coming up. Pay attention to this dialogue. I, I'm always the teacher. You know, you can't help it. Say, so watch this. Here it comes. This is why it's here for you. Not for me. I know it. Watch this. <sighs> Douglas met Lincoln. And they, they respected one another. Douglas disappointed that you didn't come quicker to emancipation, but Lincoln did. As Lincoln said, it, it came slowly. Just one quick story about the Emancipation Proclamation in behalf of Lincoln. It, at one time, it, I know I don't want to overrun my time. I know some of you got to get to bed early. Uh, I, I know, you, you know when, the, when the street lights go on, remember that? I want you in the house when the street lights go on. I remember that. that it was the custom. What a beautiful custom. We can't do it today. But it was the custom on New Year's Day that the president would stand on the gravel in the, on, in the gravel driveway of the White House, and people would queue up and to shake hands with the president to wish him a happy new year. And he would wish you a happy new year. Isn't that sweet? Obviously, we can't do that today. Lincoln, January 1, 1863, was out on the driveway, shaking hands, shaking hands, shaking hands. And finally, you know, the line, the, it, it dried up. And Lincoln had told his cabinet, I am signing the Emancipation Proclamation tonight. I told these states, these southern states, if you're not back in by January 1, 1863, I'm signing it, permanent. And so the cabinet gathered, and he had the document in front of him, and he had a pen, you know, those old quill pens with that thick, viscous black ink, and he picked up the pen and it fumbled out of his fingers. He tried to pick it up again and it fumbled out of his fingers again. He'd been shaking hands all day. His fingers were swollen, and he sent for ice to the ice house to reduce the swelling, because Lincoln, I'm going to sign this thing. I said I would do it, and I'm going to do it. And I don't want people 10 years from now, or 100 years from now, to see a thin, a very thin and wavering signature, like at the end, I wasn't sure, I flinched, I wasn't sure, I want a good, firm signature. And he signed it with his full name. Lincoln typically signed a document, A. Lincoln. He signed it, Abraham Lincoln. There's my signature. And as he said, if I'm remembered for anything, it will be for this. I just expropriated $4 billion worth of private property. That's Lincoln. He was aware at the moment what had just happened. And sometimes things happen gradually, don't they? But he was there, and I signed it. If I'm remembered for anything, it will be for this. And the war labored on, didn't it? And with Lincoln's death, Douglas moored Lincoln's death. He did. He had no use for Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was a racist. And Andrew, John just, Andrew Johnson just continued some of those terrible, the, the black codes, the marching of the Klan. He wanted no part of the Freedmen's Bureau. Vetoed it. Vetoed it. As I said, he began, to, he began to fail. He began to fail. And he died of a heart attack in February of 18, I think it was February. Uh, maybe not, but he died in 1877. 18, no, 1895. He was 77 years old. And his last major speech, The Lesson of the Hour, it's worth reading. And in the lesson of the hour, he said, the way to solve the race problem and to bring peace, we need to love, trust, and appreciate each other. And if we learn to love, trust, and appreciate each other, we will have peace in this country. This is the lesson of the hour. I am leaving you. This is my last 
public message to the country. Read it. He also wrote a very preachy, and uh, what does the 4th of July mean to black men? And, 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 and I mean, he's rather preachy. He's angry here. But he points out, we want what you white guys were looking for in 1776. That's what this is about. It's, you know, it's about freedom. It's about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as we define it for us, like you guys did. And with that 14th Amendment, citizenship, due process, equal protection of the law, the most litigated, the most litigated language, the most litigated words in the Constitution as of today. And 13, 14, and 15. The Spielberg film, I know I'm, I know I'm way over. Way over. No, not that much over. You took some of my time, and so did you. I paid for this microphone. Remember Ronald Reagan? I paid for this microphone. That, the 13th Amendment, the Spielberg film was about the 13th Amendment. And it's interesting, and I'll leave it here. So the 13th Amendment was passed in 18, December of 1865. Lincoln did not live to see it, but, but, but he insisted that it was in the Republican platform in 1864, in the plank as a, of, in the Republican platform. He knew that the Emancipation Proclamation only had, it was an executive order, you know, from the desk of the president. And another president could simply overturn it. And I want to make this permanent. It's tough to get an amendment in, but when they're in, they're tough to get out. We've only got one out, the 18th Amendment, which was a foolish amendment, prohibition. That's not what the framers intended to do. In that, in that election of 1864, the plank in the, in the in Republican platform, I want the Emancipation Proclamation to become an amendment. It's so hard to get them in, but they're hard to get out. And that's what that Spielberg film is about. But here's my story. I don't know who this was. You could look it up. I can't, I can't remember every name. But some guy, after he saw the film, got on the internet. Some guys aren't busy enough. Some guy got on, I don't, I don't mean to look at you, know, got on the internet. I'm one of them. All right, you're okay, right? You're comfortable in your own skin. That's good, that's good, I like that. And, and, and some guy went, wanted to look at the, 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 the order in which the states ratified the amendment, the 13th Amendment. Illinois was first, Lincoln. We were like seventh or eighth. And he's going down, he's going down, and he's going down, he's going down, and he's going down. And he notices that Mississippi, Mississippi, Mississippi burning, I, he notices that Mississippi never ratified the 13th Amendment as of the production of Spielberg's Lincoln. But you see, it did not have to, because you only need three quarters of the states. And so he said, wait a minute. So this became a story. It got back to Mississippi. And I said, well, yes, we did send along a ratification, but we don't know what happened to the paperwork. <laughs> they never sent it out. So they ratified, so they ratified the 13th Amendment. You can check me on I can't make it up. This is too good of a story. It might have been 1997, 1995, whenever the Spielberg film came out. But can you imagine this guy? 46, 47, 48, 46, 47, 48. <laughs> Who didn't ratify? Mississippi. I should have known. So I'll close with that. Agitate, agitate, agitate. Be of stout heart. Be of brave heart. Be persistent. Not stubborn. Stubborn's being argumentative and difficult. Persistent. And, when, and, how, and, and, and for empathy, when you have no recourse, that the anger, when you have nobody to help you, and you know you're right, and you know they know you're right, that's tough. Question, please, maybe an observation, a, something maybe I can dig into a little bit. We have covered so much tonight, haven't we? We've really covered the waterfront. Yes, please. Were the Quakers, were the, were the, Quakers the first abolitionists, the Quakers? The Quakers were, the, yes. The, were the Quakers the first abolitionists? Yes, they were. And, and, and Benjamin Franklin was an abolitionist. Yeah. And Benjamin Franklin founded an abolitionist society in, in, Phil, in, in Philadelphia. They were the first. Yeah. And also, in, in terms of Alexander Hamilton, who's very hot, he opposed slavery because he felt economically it was foolish. 
You know, you get more production out of a free man or a woman than you do out of an enslaved person. And also, they don't see one way that you could sabotage from within. You broke tools. You let animals go. You set a fire in the barn. You ground up glass and you put it in Absolutely. the Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Just little things, you know, that uh, I know what I just did. And you don't. Just little small, little small victories, but the big, big victories. 13, 14, 15, and, and the 19th Amendment. And we'll see where we go from here. I, I don't want you to, to leave us with the wrong impression of Ben Franklin. He, he was an abolitionist, but that was after he had owned slaves. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. In fact, when he had his newspaper, he advertised. Yeah. He, he advertised for runaways. Then he dropped it when he became an abolitionist. Yeah. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. How do you know that? You do it for a living? Yeah. Okay. That, that's a detail on it. Only guys who did it for a living know that. The other thing is, number one, is, you know, his mother was born in Nantucket, and so he had that whole Quaker yeah. aspect. But he died regretting, and he put it in writing, that he did not fight ardently against slavery. Yeah. So he actually pinned that. Yeah. And we have that. These are, I mean, these, these were the, you know, ben, John Adams, John Adams knew you know, that slavery was a gross immorality. But he said, this is the best we're going to get in 1776. Thomas Jefferson always said, Jefferson, talk about, it. you know, a guy that threw shadows at everybody. You know, will the real Thomas Jefferson really stand up? You know, Jefferson said that it's the duty of our generation to, to deal with the, the independence. It's the duty of the next generation to deal with slavery, uh, to, to, to uh, you know, to deal with the slavery. And, that's, and, and, and Jefferson, here's a guy who had a concubine for 30 years, right? Sally Hemings, who well, had three or four children. And she was with him and laid out his clothes every day. You know, bing, 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 bing. And we know the rest of that story. Yes? Um, when, when the uh, Underground Railroad, Canada was a part of it, right? Who? Canada, Canada, some of the slaves went to Canada during the... Oh, yeah, that, yeah the, uh, part of the depots yeah. were up in Canada, right. Yeah, Would they, did the Canadians ever get involved with, and become abolitionists as well and work with the... I don't have a memory of that. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I know there were abolitionist houses in Brockton, aren't there? Right. Yeah. There had to be. I mean, I know that there, there are in Bridgewater, yeah, you know, where I'm from. You know, where, uh, you know... The, uh, the one in Bridgewater, which is uh, right near uh, the Common. Yeah, that's right. I know just where it is. Yeah. There's a plaque on yeah, it. Yeah. That's also where the uh, the couple had escaped. They um, oh, their name escapes me right now. But Ellen and, and Kraft, Ellen and Kraft. William Kraft. Okay. They actually stayed at that station mm -hmm. before they came to Boston. The and this is the first of the slave narratives. There's a whole genre of slave narr narratives. Um, Harriet Jacobs yes. does a nice job. Boy, she hid for the longest time, didn't she? Yeah, and, and, and Harriet Tubman, who could not read or write, her slave narrative didn't appear until 1869, and she, she dictated it. And I'm thinking here of, um, I mean, this, um, Jacob Lawrence, you know, the artist, you know, depicting, taking the, the, the events from the life of, of, um, of, of, of Frederick Douglass, and I think there were 25 or 30 portraits that he did. And um, one thing, you know, in, in teaching, so you don't have time to do everything. You've got a clock. But one thing you can, one can do is take some of his portraits and connect it up with reading this, and you just need time, and to make sure A, students read it, because they don't, <laughs> and be able to connect it up with, with, the, with the events in this book, only that makes it alive. You say, you know, and... What are you going to do? Yes, ma'am. I got you too. I didn't catch the name of the book. Pardon me? The name of the book. It's called Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, 1845, and you can read it at a red light. And it was written in uh, Lynn. Right, 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 written in Lynn. And by the way, and by, and by the way, <laughs> Douglass was so annoyed in Lynn, he and a buddy got kicked off a railroad car because they weren't seated in the, co in the college section. And he was furious at that. Hey, I'm, I'm Frederick Douglass. What are you doing kicking me off? They didn't, they didn't kick him off. They actually ripped out the seat. Yeah, yeah. While he was still in yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like that, yeah. He was still in the seat. They ripped the seat out of, you know, bolts and everything. 
in, out you go. You know, it, it's like that airline. Remember the airline situation of the, the, uh, the Asian passenger? Oh, that was terrible. That was a few, four or five years ago, right? They ripped him right out of his seat. They, Plessy versus Ferguson. You know, when Ferguson tried to get on that, that railroad car, and, and he, he passed. Uh, he, you know, he, he passed as a white guy. Yeah. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. We know who you are. Exactly. Come on. Get off. Get off. That's a good court case. So, so I hope you, I hope we had some, oh yes, I've got, in your best, Mrs. Douglas voice. So what do we do now? Oh. That's a good question. What do we do now? What do we do now? We wait, we wait for November, the off-year elections. We wait, regroup, rearm, reorganize, and always keep your powder dry and your armor bright. You know, always, always. Don't scare me. Uh, thank you. Thank you.